Writing in the Name of God, Why the Bible's Authors Are Not Who We Think They Are. Uh, I think it's important to look at what scholars are saying and look at what the evidence is and then make a decision. If it means having to change what you believe about the Bible or believe about God or believe about Jesus, then I, if the facts seem to be taking you in a certain direction, you should go with the facts. They simply might modify their faith so that they have a more informed faith, uh, a, a faith that knows something about the history of early Christianity. The opposite of an informed faith is an ignorant faith, and I simply don't think that ignorant faith does anybody any good. Writing in the Name of God, Why the Bible's Authors Are Not Who We Think They Are. Uh, these books are written in a very high-level Greek. These books are written by highly educated Greeks, probably living outside of Palestine, 40 or 50 years later, uh, a certain kind of irony because when looked at historically, these books, in fact, are written by people claiming to be someone other than who they were, and so they were lying about it. By people claiming to be someone other than who they were, and so they were lying about it. These for years, trying to determine what biblical writings are authentic and which are, well, forgeries. His latest book is called Forged, Writing in the Name of God. Why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are. We first spoke this March. Now, your book is about forgeries. So what do you mean by that word? Right. So when I use the term forgery, I, I'm using it in a very specific sense, uh, in which I mean somebody who writes a book claiming to be someone other than who they are in order to deceive his readers. So that it uh, forgery involves a false authorial claim. And did it mean the same thing 2,000 years ago? Who, who spoke Aramaic and were uh, lower class peasants without an education. These books are written by highly educated Greeks, probably living outside of Palestine. A certain kind of irony because when looked at historically, these books in fact are written by people claiming to be someone other than who they were. And so they were lying about it. Writing in the name of God why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are. And the Baphomet is always holding up the same symbolic hand gesture of his right hand that Jesus is almost always pictured doing, which I hardly think is a coincidence. My conclusion, this Jesus character is Lucifer. And the New Testament were created. Esau and his descendants were and still are the sworn enemies of the Israelites. If you read the Apocrypha and the Book of Yasha, you'll find that the Greeks descend from the Edomite Duke Amalek and the Romans from Duke Lotan and Duke Zepho. Our enemy is described as a cunning hunter and a good hunter studies his prey. The Edomites have studied our writings and they know that when the Most High is with us, then we are unbeatable. No one can stand against us. And I also realized that when we disobeyed the Most High's laws, statutes and commandments, then the Most High would turn his back on us and we would become vulnerable. When the Edomite Greeks took the Israelites captive, the first thing they did was force them to worship Zeus. But that approach failed. Indeed, the first book of Maccabees attests to show how adherence to the law became a rallying point of a robust resistance. By the time of the Edomite Roman captivity, they hit upon the idea of removing the memories of the Israelites and providing them with a new God that they would have to direct their prayers, praise and attention to, supposedly in order to worship the entity masquerading as the Most High. The Jesus story is not in the Book of Remembrance, nor in the Book of Enoch, because it was added in by the Greco-Roman Edomites, the sworn enemies of the Israelites. 1 Maccabees chapter 3 verse 48 tells how they would write themselves into the book and laid open the book of the law wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. And so they forced their new religion upon the Israelites at the point of the sword to enslave them and keep them inadvertently worshipping a strange god of wood and stone unawares. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 36 and the Lord shall bring thee, and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, 
unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. The first and most important commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Isn't praising, worshipping and praying to the New Testament God, Jesus Christ, breaking the first commandment? The second commandment is, Thou shalt not make or bow down to idols. Aren't the crucifix, wooden crosses, paintings of Jesus and statues of Mary and child, idols of wood and stone? The followers of certain controlled opposition Hebrew Israelite camps have been fooled using word magic to place this Christ idol before the Most High in exactly the way the Most High commanded us not to. Instead of calling upon the Most High, they are instructed to say the words Yahweh Ba Hashem Yahweh Shai, which means the Most High in the name of Jesus. They are placing the Most High in a subordinate position and subject to the authority of Jesus, which is deeply blasphemous and breaks the first commandment every time it's uttered. The Most High says in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Now that seems pretty clear to me, as it also says um, several times that he's a jealous God. So does it make sense that a character can come along and make claims such as this? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. In my humble opinion, this is a major contradiction and another case of the Most High being placed in a subordinate role to Jesus. Personally, I'm going to go with, thus saith the Most High. People are now waking up to the fact that we are the Israelites, and that we are in the predicament we are in, because we did not keep to the commandments of the Most High, and so incurred the curses of Deuteronomy 28. We are also realising that the way out of this captivity is to return to the law, statutes and commandment, or the Old Covenant, and cry out to the Most High. But doesn't that completely go against the idea of grace and new covenant and the whole point of Jesus? The camps and messianic Israelites, all those who are following the Jesus idol, are finding the story in the Book of Remembrance because that story is not in the New Testament with its tales of grace and new covenant. What we're witnessing is a return to the old covenant, a return to the Old Testament where Jesus cannot be found. The camps and messianic Israelites are busy making YouTube videos because it's plain to see that the so-called Old Testament prophecy is coming to pass in the world today. And yet they still perform verbal gymnastics to try and shoehorn Jesus into the story, even though it's becoming increasingly obvious he just doesn't fit. I just watched a video made by a poor deluded brother whose solution was to throw out the whole 1619 to 2019 400 years prophecy simply because the events of the New Testament haven't happened yet. Duh! The frustrating part of all this for me is that so many of my brothers and sisters of the Hebrew nation are still ensnared in strange religions of wood and stone. If we look back into history even in captivity, the Israelites would resist the imposition of strange religions. The second book of Maccabees, chapter 7, starkly describes a level of devotion to the law when a whole family is tortured and murdered horribly for refusing the command of the Greek king to eat pork and sacrifice to Zeus. When one realizes that the Jews that refused to convert to Christianity in the Spanish Inquisition were in fact dark-skinned Hebrews, the ancestors of the so-called Negroes scattered across the Americas, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean and throughout the world, then it becomes clear that converting the children of Jacob to this pagan religion was not an easy task. The Inquisition held many events called auto de fe, acts of faith, where the Israelites who stubbornly clung to their law were tortured and burned alive 
rather than convert to this pagan religion. In one particular Christian act of faith, a young girl was forced to watch her parents undergo cruel torture and then burning before being offered the opportunity to convert and avoid such horrors. The girl appeared to consider the offer but then broke away and ran headlong into the fire and was consumed. This act of heroism so moved the spectators and there were lots of spectators watching this like entertainment that it halted auto de fe's for 12 years. Nonetheless, the Inquisition virtually wiped out the Hebrews living in Spain and Portugal with little success. So their next strategy involved removing the children between the ages of 3 and 14 from their parents and transporting them to the Isle of St. Thomas to be raised as Christians. However, there are accounts of mothers killing their own children rather than have them inducted into this vile religion. Which brings me to the source of my frustration with my Hebrew brothers and sisters. Christianity is not your religion. You were born into it and accept it because your parents accepted it, because they were born into it, all the way back to an ancestor who was tortured into accepting it, or had it force-fed to them as a helpless child your ancestors who resisted to their last breath and died in horrifically gruesome ways to avoid conversion will be thoroughly ashamed of their descendants clinging on to this idol with such zeal after their sacrifice to prevent it. I'm not telling you to just renounce this Christ out of hand, but I'm pleading with you to question the narrative that you've been taught. Take some time out to put aside this Jesus, Yeshua, Yahusha, Yahawashai, or whatever alias you have for the Christ God, and read the Book of Remembrance without this idol in your heart. And plug in the fact that the so-called Old Testament was written by and about your ancestors for you at this moment in history. The chances are that if you're listening to this, then you've already awoken to a multitude of lies that you were relentlessly told by the same people who have been hiding the one true creator of all things. And with each lie that you encountered, there was an initial period of disbelief, but there was also something that drove you to look beyond the story that you once believed, until eventually the lie was exposed and a truth became self-evident. This is no different.